Okay, right. So I, I want to talk very quickly about a, a group of gravestones. This is something I, a group of, of memorials I encountered entirely by chance relatively recently. And I just thought it was an intriguing story, which I thought raised some bigger bigger questions about, about memorialization. Um, I was out with the family um, on, our, on our COVID sanctioned walk recently uh, when I was exploring the small cemetery, the Church of England cemetery, a village called Sutton on the Forest, which is about 10 miles north of York. Uh, and I encountered, you know, I'm, I, as an archeologist, I spend too much time wandering around cemeteries. Um, and I, you know, I, I tend to stop to read the gravestones and I encountered this group of gravestones, which superficially look like any other cluster of burials you might find in a late 19th or 20th century cemetery. But with a little bit closer inspection, um, it turned out they were almost, well, they were all Polish. Uh, there's this distinct section of Polish graves in an otherwise fairly standard rural um, rural churchyard, rural cemetery. So I started you know, finding out, trying to find out a little bit about why uh, they were here. In terms of their chronology, the earliest graves are uh, early 1950s, uh, and the latest ones are actually 21st to 21st century. It soon became very clear that the reason why those graves were there um, was because of this thing here. This is the Eastmore settle resettlement uh, center. Following uh, the, the, you can see this, the, cent, the, cent, the uh, village in the middle and the cemetery is out on the western side of the village. If you look at the uh, site I've highlighted as the settlement center, you can see that distinctive triangle in the middle. And for those of you who spend too much time on Google Earth will know that normally indicates a, uh, a, a former uh, Air Force base or an RAF base. They're, they're all that survives of the, of the runways. Now, Eastmore was set up in, uh, well, originally it was an RAF base developed during World War II, but it was one of a series of resettlement camps which were established across Britain in, in the immediate post-World War period to settle uh, Polish soldiers and their families, most of whom who had fought with General Anders' Polish Second Corps. Uh, the, there's a fascinating story about the Polish Second Corps. Second Corps. They were Polish troops who'd been captured by the Russians imprisoned in, in, in Siberia, then once Germany invaded Russia, a Polish army was formed in Siberia, a free Polish army was formed in Siberia. They marched down through uh, Siberia, Russia, Iran, ending up in the Middle East before a lot of them being deployed at Monte Cassino in Italy and ending up in, um, in Britain. Uh, they were formed, the army was kind of, the, the regiment was kind of reformed as the Polish Resettlement and Deployment Corps in 1946. Uh, and these were essentially uh, units through which Polish civilians and, and military could be settled in Britain. And most, almost all these camps were reused RAF bases. And you can see here on the top left, there's an image of a funeral coming out of the church uh, at uh, Eastmore, which is a repurposed, you can see it's a repurposed Nissan, Nissan hut. So there's a really interesting and little known story here. But I got very interested in actually kind of looking at the graves themselves. Now, what's interesting, you know, I, I tend to approach these things with an archaeological eye, and you can see phasing amongst this, with this cemetery. First of all, there are a set of very simple and uniform graves, these, these ones here in the main picture, uh, which are clearly made from the cheap, they're uniform, they're, they're not stone, they're cast concrete with metal, metal in, uh, in, in armature, uh, some of them are starting to fall apart. Uh, and these seem to be the, the earliest phase of burials dating from the, the very early, early 1950s. But we can see phasing in the wider assemblage. As we get in more into the 1950s, we see a greater diversity of burial monuments for the, for the, for the Polish civilians who died at Eastmoor. You see on the left, this, this guy, Josef Kwab, um, he actually has the Eastmoor hostel written on his on his gravestone. But what's interesting, these are uh, to the greatest diversity of, of, of st stones. Rather than making themselves, they seem to be commissioning gravestones from local, local funeral directors, but they continue to be, the uh, inscriptions continue to be written in Polish. Um, we also see what looks like in places, 
some of the earlier graves being removed, some of the earlier simple Polish graves, uh, concrete graves being removed, and then later, presumably as families came into more income, came into more funds, replacing the old simple uniform graves with more, more individualized bespoke graves. So we're actually seeing, I think, a second phase of, of kind of monumentalization going on here. Also, we see the, the, generate, the development of, I suppose, what you might call multi-generational plots. Whilst a lot of the Poles moved away from the area uh, from the 60s, some stayed, and from further exploration, it's clear quite a few stayed in York, a lot stayed in West Yorkshire. And we are seeing families coming back to be buried here, often with what presumably were originally parents or grandparents, and we're seeing kind of sequences of family graves. Um, presumably these people aren't actually resident, but they're coming back to be buried with the first generation of, of immigrant in their, in their family. Uh, and we're seeing some, you know, some of the latest graves are, are 21st century. You can see they're still being, being actively maintained. And we're seeing some interesting changes, the shift from being entirely written in Polish to being bilingual with some text in, in Polish and some text in English. Um, so there's interesting things going on there as well. There's other, there's other kind of stories to explore and very much at the beginning of my journey trying to understand these monuments. For example, obviously as a Polish community, they are Catholic, they're Catholic, but they are, and we've seen they have their own church at the East Moor Resettlement Camp. There was a, a permanent chaplain there. Um, but we, um, they are being buried in a Church of England cemetery. Although it's not part of the, the immediate graveyard around the church itself, it is the Church of England cemetery. It's, it's a new extension from, from the old parish churchyard. So there's something interesting going on there about decisions being made about where people should be buried. I'd, I'd imagine otherwise the nearest Catholic place where or non-denominational non burial ground would have been in York. So as a decision being made, people would rather be buried locally than in a, in a Protestant churchyard than further away in something non-denominational. Equally, there's a story here about the local community themselves who were happy to accept uh, these incoming incoming group with a different different kind of religious confession coming in, accepting them into their own uh, their own their own family burial ground. So there's something there's an interesting story there about the relationship between these these uh, these, these Polish immigrants and and this local small rural community. As I've been poking around, though, I, 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 it's one of these things where you can start pulling at threads and, and unraveling more, more complicated stories, because it's clear that some of the poles from the East Moor Settlement Camp were actually buried, weren't all buried in this particular churchyard. For example, uh, in York Cemetery, uh, in the public graves, and public graves are graves where people couldn't afford their own single burial plot and were buried in groups. Um, there is a burial of a guy called Mikolai Prozhodny. He's buried there actually alongside a, um, a, a former Yugoslav uh, immigrant, uh, this guy Vladislav Sondermeyer, who was also in, a, in another uh, hostel, um, resettlement hostel, also near York, at another airfield at Full Sutton. Um, so for some reason, Mikolai was buried in York Cemetery rather than in Full Sutton. Also, on the edge of York, there's another municipal cemetery, the, the Fulford Cemetery. And here there's a Polish war cemetery with Polish pilots who buried uh, during, during following accidents in the early 1940s, but also a number of Polish soldiers who'd been in the resettlement corps, who I guess were still in the military when they died at East Sutton, had been buried at Fulford. So there's some interesting patterns about not everyone in the resettlement camp was necessarily buried in the, uh, the local cemetery at Sutton on the Forest. So there's some interesting stories there which need unpicking. Another really interesting story is this, is this gravestone here. Now, this gravestone here is, you can see it's dated 1954, but it's clearly uh, a much more modern, that kind of black granite doesn't come in until a bit later. So I think it's been, again, a case of somebody putting in a gravestone uh, replacing a gravestone, perhaps a family, once again, once they came into money. And this guy, Josef Piller, is really interesting because you can see on his gravestone, it says, and this is where Google Translate, I don't speak any Polish, but Google Translate is very useful, saying that he is the designer of the memorial, the Polish memorial in Buana Mkubwa in Zambia. 
where we have a Polish uh, memorial. Why do we have a Polish memorial in rural Zambia? And that's because another one of the stories of the Polish uh, kind of diaspora as part of uh, the, the, the move from Siberia was the establishment of a large number of Polish resettlement camp or Polish camps um, across East Africa, across British East Africa, where civilians were settled. Uh, so we have a story yeah, we have in our, in Joseph Pillar's grave, it refers to this monument here in Zambia, uh, it tell, and obviously his own journey starts uh, in Poland via Siberia, through Iran, uh, obviously through Zambia, ending up in, in rural North Yorkshire. So there's really, again, there's really interesting kind of trajectories and biographies uh, uh, encapsulated in some of, these, some of these objects. But to kind of finish off, there, there's a series of kind of, kind of broader thoughts, which I, as I've been looking at, at these objects has, has kind of got me thinking. First of all, what's really interesting is a contrast in the permanence and stability of burial of a burial site with the transience of both the, the Poles, these Polish community during their lives, and also um, particularly the transience of their experience at Sutton on the forest in the resettlement camp. And I think it's interesting where we're seeing cemeteries and, and, and burial sites as I think a way of trying to create and maintain permanence in a world which as we see some of these individuals was incredibly, incredibly transient. And I think it's you make, make us think a little bit about how other communities, immigrant communities, refugee communities, migrant communities might try and make permanence in transient worlds. And whether we're looking at things like the, uh, the, Yemeni, the Yemeni community of South Shields or uh, prisoners of war, so the Ukrainian prisoners of war, this is of uh, the Ukrainian church at the former prisoner of war camp at Hormyor in Dumfriesshire, uh, where again, they we see the places of worship coming again very clearly as a way of maintaining permanent. So it's, it's a way of, I think, thinking about how we might look at the materiality of, of the refugee and immigrant um, experience. So that's thinking about how people might, how immigrant communities might memorialise and, and kind of commemorate themselves. Also, I think there's another thing to think about in terms of how do we as a larger community talk about, commemorate, commemorate, commemorate and memorialise wider refugee and immigrant communities. Um, this, this map, I was, I was staggered by, this is a map showing 20th century refugee internment and resettlement camps in Britain. And it's, we tend to think of refugee camps as something which happens abroad, but it's not just the Poles, it's the Belgians in First World War, Basques during the Spanish Civil War, internment camps of Germans in the First and Second World War, but refugees from the Hungarian uprising of the 1950s, Ugandan Asians, Vietnamese, we have a long, we have a landscape of refugees and, and, and transients in Britain, which we don't really talk about, we don't really commemorate, um, because these sites are inherently transient, they're not permanent in the landscape. So I think there's some really interesting questions about, this is an important part of the 20th century cultural experience, but how do we go about commemorating and memorializing and talk about it? Because it can be difficult heritage, it's politicized, it's problematic. For example, in the case of the Ukrainian prisoner of war camp I just showed you a second ago, those are Ukrainians who fought with the Germans uh, in World War II. They are not kind of Poles who fought on the Allied side. They fought on the wrong side, uh, wrong in inverted commas. I think how 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 do we refrain? How do we try and tackle this kind of problematic, problematic, difficult, difficult heritage? Um, here's some examples of how this has been done with a Polish community. We see on the right we've got the um, the in the case of Fairford, one of the biggest camps, uh, it's actually a monument erected by Polish, the Polish community within Britain to commemorate the site of the Polish camp. On the top left, you see this fantastic memorial to Wojciech, who was the, the, uh, one of the mascots of the Polish Second Corps. He, Wojciech is the bear, not the soldier. This is uh, in Edinburgh because he retired to Edinburgh Zoo after the war. And I went down a wormhole this morning of finding out there's at least six, six separate memorials to Wojciech. There's more memorials to Wojciech than there is actually to the Polish Second Corps itself. Um, but finally, I think even taking it even bigger, there's questions about thinking about monuments because 
what I've been talking about today has been an assemblage rather than an individual set of monuments. This is a group of monuments which has evolved over time. This isn't one individual marker. These are essentially private monuments put up by private individuals and families, but they are in a public space, which is you know, a, a churchyard. They are they mean something to the family, but there's no discussion about what they are for the visitor. And finally, it's a reminder that monuments aren't just static things which are erected and then left. Monuments are dynamic. They are maintained. In this case, you can see we've got flowers on the graves. We see the creation of multi-generational plots, but they can also be left to disappear. They can left to erode some graves. Some of these graves are clearly not cared for. So I think the idea, some of the, some of the idea which the prehistorian John Barrett has come up with, the idea of monument as project. Monuments are dynamic and have biographies. I think that's a helpful way of thinking about these things too, particularly as we think about how monuments might be taken down as well as erected. OK, I'll leave it there. Thanks, David. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to get in there right away and ask a question this time because I didn't uh, before. And um, at, just at the end, actually, I had a, a few questions, but just at the end, it made me think about biographies of, of monuments um, because I have a, a student maybe listening in, um, who is looking at monuments that are now in the British Museum. So that's actually monuments that are kind of itinerant in, in a sense. They've been collected and, and taken um, out of one context and, and put in another. And it made me think about that kind of definition of, of monuments and the, uh, you know, the, the value that we place on monuments in terms of their collectability, I suppose. I mean, could you see any of these monuments being in a museum or, or you know, do they make sense? And are they valued as individual kind of artifacts as almost um, museum commodities in the same kind of way? My, my sense is no. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think so. Because I, I think it's very tricky with graves. Because I think with all monuments, there's this relationship about the, the place and the the monument. In some cases, mon the, there's a tight relationship between place and monument. And you get that particularly, obviously, with graves, where the grave marker is meant to mark the mm. grave. Other monuments are placed very you know, random random statues of Queen Victoria, they're, they're everywhere and they're not tied, there's no kind of relationship between monument and place. I think here it's about the place is all important. I think it's particularly for, for burial, burial monuments. Also, these are these are living monuments because you know they are maintained by families, there's still family connections. From poking around and, and talking to people with Polish connections in York, I know that people still visit them even if you know even if they're not burying there so there these are a living assemblage these aren't mm. detached from a community the community is dispersed but yeah. it still maintains relationships so i think there it's all about place and it's all about assemblage they, they work together there's also there's something to be said about the fact that we don't in we tend not to invest a lot in our burial monuments as great kind of art projects in a sense, yeah. um, which is not true of other other places. And I was just thinking and contrasting with sort of, you know, public monuments like the William Armstrong monument or, or public mm. statues, you know, that are, then there's the question of, you know, um, is this sort of thing something that you would need to preserve in the same kind of way? But um, I, I just have one more thing that I wanted to ask before I'll open up the, the floor, and that is about burials as permanence. Do you think that uh, burials are the kind of perfect way, in a sense, to assert a permanence on the landscape because they have a kind of sacrosanct quality you're not supposed to disturb them. You're not supposed to take them away um, that other monuments might not achieve. It's tricky. It's very culturally specific, something like that. I think in Britain, because we're surrounded by old cemeteries with low, where, where gravestones and plots are essentially in perpetuity, 
we're kind of surrounded with the sense that gravestones and grave markers are something which are permanent. If you go to France, for example, graves are leased over, over you know, generations. And if a family dies out, the graves are removed and, and the bodies are taken out of the graves and they are put in a common ossuary and the grave plot is passed on to somebody else. It's, re, it's, it's re, reused, recycled. So even, you know, even in Western Europe, there are very different attitudes to the permanence of burial markers. Now, doing, building things like monuments on top of them does make it harder to, to get rid of a grave. And of course, you know, within the cemeteries, there's lots of rules about what you can and can't do, which I think is partly to do with controlling that. And you know, even in modern cemeteries, there's a lot, of, particularly in modern cemeteries, there's a lot of you know, limitations on what you can do. Some of you may have seen recently, there's a big hoo-ha about a grave in Coventry where a woman wanted an gay Irish Gaelic uh, epitaph on and the Church of England refused it because using Irish Gaelic was seen as potentially being political um, it led to a huge it's all all right now but you know even, even, even the choice of language on a grave is is can be very contentious so mm. yeah it's, it's a lot of it is about agency what individuals or agency individuals have and how they are constrained by uh, formal structures and and kind of soft social structures as well so yeah, it, I think it's very culturally specific. Thanks. I'm going to open up the floor to questions now. Um, if anybody wants to use the uh, raise hand feature, do that, or you can simply unmute yourself and jump in. Thanks very much. Can I just make a, a couple of quick comments? Uh, John Dixon, sorry, you can't see us because this computer doesn't have a camera on it. Apologize for that. Um, Couple of quick points for David. Um, sorry, this is a bit historical. Late 60s, early 70s, um, we worked in uh, Wrexham in North Wales and they had Penley Hospital, which was one of the Polish resettlement locations. And it's interesting, it was called the hospital because by then it was nearly an old people's home. Um, but there was a significant community of Poles there. Um, and one of the things the district council who I worked for was responsible for was maintaining the burial record in Gresford Cemetery. Mm. You will know of Gresford because of the mining disaster. And in the Gresford Cemetery, there's a common multiple grave, which I think, if I remember correctly, there were 14 Poles buried. Might have been some checks in there as well, but I think there was 14 in, in one in one plot, which I was, I was quite astonished by that. And we happen to have the record of who was in there. But you might be aware, David, I don't know if you are, that certainly in the 60s, there was a Polish army unit as part of the British army serving in BAOR as a tank transporter company, completely manned by Poles who had a tremendously positive reputation. Um, we could obviously look them up, but uh, they were there. And the second thing was, I believe some of the people at Penley were used for mine clearing on what had been trading areas. So they were actually employed in clearing ordnance from those areas. So, And that was in the late 60s. Yeah, and Pen Penley's an, an, an amazing place, obviously, because of the hospital. It, it, was, it had that Polish presence much longer than a lot of the resettlement camps. But what's interesting is, I mean, as I understand it, the, the, the very last remaining buildings at Penley are either about to or have just been demolished. And they were recorded as historic monuments, but not because they were resettlement camp buildings, but because they were World War II buildings. And this is this, this kind of thing, is the graves... So are you know, they on the World War II database, David? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd imagine it's all there. I've, I've just got the copy of the, of the recording report, which was done. You, you know that's held at York? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that the buildings of the camps are so transient, and it's only the burials which, which are, are, are kind of, at least at the moment, more solidly maintained. Thank you. Yes, thanks, John. Thank you, John. Uh, Natalie Wilkinson, you have a question. Hi, it's probably a little bit obvious. And now that I've written it down, it seems it's sort of, forgive me if it seems a bit silly, but 
when you were speaking to the Polish community about the graves, was it more that it was a sense of creating a kind of permanence or a, a having been resettled, having moved, is it putting down roots? Is it creating that sense of community? Is it kind of making a place where their community can be established and somewhere to always come back to? Um, this what, sorry, this is what I'm trying to find out about at the moment. Right. I'm, I'm trying to kind of identify, I've, I've got, you know, I've got, a, I, have, I have a Polish friend in York who's, I mean, his family, whose father was, was Polish Second Corps, and, but she, but her family weren't at, weren't at Eastmore, they were at a different camp, and I'm starting to kind of put out, put out links, but certainly reading around, and there's quite a lot of oral history being done on this, mm. is, you know, one, one, one of the things that happened as they became more established is they went from things like communal kitchens to individual kitchens and cooking by themselves mm. over time as individual family groups move from communal life to family life. Also, particularly the churches are, you know, the, the church is so important in, in Poland anyway. The churches are incredibly important. And these are converted Nissan huts, but they become the focus, a focus of social life, as well as with, with the kind of feast days and Corpus Christi and things. They're much more important than um, just, you know, we would see as just, just a church. They're, they're, they're about the centre of the community. It was a huge, it was clear from the pictures. There's a lot of archive pictures of these things. The amount of investment the community are, are, are putting in so there's clearly a sense of making place equally i think there's a sense that people didn't want to stay trapped in the camps they wanted to move on they wanted to build new lives as well so um yeah this, this is something i'm just at the beginning just at the beginning of at the moment just starting to find out about so it's a it's a fascinating. Yeah, it's you want to find out more about yeah it's really fascinating i know there are some families some polish families in eastwood um mm -hmm. or there were um sort of hilltop and eastwood area just sort of in the knots area yeah i mean i i i spent i i spent some of my, my childhood in reading in berkshire where there's a big big polish community and you know, they actually had they'd actually taken over a former church of england church and it was a polish speaking catholic church entirely for the polish community i used to cycle past it all the time so yeah it's interesting the way i'm interested in thinking about how these groups might start building once they're out of the camps and become established West Yorkshire, for example, a lot in West Yorkshire, how they start building communities there. It's like the South Yemeni community in, in South Shields with the emergence of the prayer houses and the cemeteries. And so there's a lot, lot to have a think about, I think. The early days. Thank you. So just to say, Richard uh, Pires has, has pointed out that um, graves aren't sacrosanct in the UK and there are lots of gravestones that have been removed to the periphery. Of, I actually know this because I went walking in a graveyard just today where that uh, happened. Actually, it's St Margaret's um, that we heard about uh, last week um, when, and lots of gravestones to one side. But yes, I suppose it's not so much the legal thing that I was thinking of, but just the kind of, you know, the imagination of it. Mary Brooks has a question, if you want to unmute yourself, Mary. Thank you. Um, and thank you, David. Fascinating, because I went to school in a town which, again, like Reading, had a very strong Polish community. So lots of my best friends at school were Polish extraction, and I learned to cook some extraordinary Polish dishes. Um, and most of those had been brought out of East End of London as railway workers and relocated into what was essentially a railway carriage town. Um, but my real question is about how gender is operating here, because most of those graves, if I understood you correctly, are for men. And I'm just interesting, is, is the memorialization family orientated is it is it military male memorialization or is it is it gendered I, female I need, memorialization or is this all too early i need i need to unpick that a little bit this is something i, I i'm not quite clear about because I, I at the moment it's purely impressionistic i wonder one thing i do wonder is how much the because it because a lot of the resettlement communities were from the Polish Second Corps, how how heavily male the wider community, the Polish community was in that early stage, uh -huh. because not everyone were able to, not all of the soldiers were able to get their families out, either out. So whether whether there was more soldiers in the community then, and more men in the community, 
I, I just don't know. I just yeah. don't know. But, cer but certainly you do seem to have a, a, a kind of normally a paternal, when you've got family groups, it does seem to be that there's a father's grave. And then, but that's mainly just because the fathers die, die earlier than, 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 the, than the mothers, uh, seemingly. But I, I, that's something I, I want to unpick a little bit. I, I want to try and record these a little bit more oh. formally. But I, I want to try and speak to the community who are using them before I do that. Thank you. So, thank you, Mary. Richard Paris has a question. Dave, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and it, it's something that I've... Um, th there's a big collection of, of Polish graves in Morpeth as well, um, in Morpeth Cemetery, which I discovered, you know, a few years ago. But actually, um, the, the Polish community has been well known. If, you, if you're an English Catholic, then the Poles are there in your parish community as well. Um, I might say something about English Catholics, you know, being a peripheral part of society as well. But I certainly went to school with uh, children with Polish names. Um, so I think it's it's what you're saying. The community has moved into the nearest it's got to a community in Britain, which is the you're very right about the importance of the church as being the symbol of their identity. And of course, a lot of these people couldn't go back to Poland, um, you know, after the Second World War. Um, you know, the ones who got who were sent to Siberia were lucky not to have been murdered by the Soviets at Katyn and other places. Um, so they couldn't go back. I think what is interesting is, um, you know, there have been cases where some Polish graves of Polish bodies have been repatriated to Poland after the collapse of communism. Um, so I think it's interesting about the attitude to the permanence is, you know, they're buried here because they had to be. But is there a, so have the families moved back to Poland since 1989 and some of the graves are, you know, not being tended anymore because of that. Um, but it's, so you've got integration with a wider community on one hand, but then obviously, you know, the, the people stayed in Britain, I think, because of the situation in their home country, they couldn't go back to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think first of all, the role of a church is incredibly important. Because, I mean, I mean, again, I, I was, I was, I, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Catholic, Catholic upbringing and, 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 and so again, in Reading, lots and lots of Poles at mm -hmm. church. I, I had kind of, kind of friends with kind of Polish surnames and stuff. So yeah, it, that, that's, the role of that is, is I think, really important in, in some senses, integrating them with some elements of the, of the British community. But again, because the Catholics themselves are on the edge, it, it, it kind of, it's, it's an ambiguous relationship. And yeah, I mean, I, I've not come across any evidence that people have been um, repatriated to any extent uh, mm. in the examples I've been looking at. Um, I suspect it's because whilst there's you know a, a lot of these guys I, I, i'm kind of trying to read between the lines looking at the names on the particularly the multi-generational kind of sets of graves looking at it, it looks like polish men marrying local women yeah so mm -hmm. you're kind of there you're kind of wedded you're a bit more wedded to the country in, yes. in that in that respect um i'm not sure whether you I'm not sure if it's as easy to pick up that happening the other way around because you lose the surnames. Mm. But you know, certainly reading reading about the settlement camp, they were you know they were working on local farms, they were working in, in York, they were had local football teams, um, they were kind of doing they were pretty well integrated, um, and everyone seems to remember them the, the the camp fondly, which is not always true because of the, the 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 camp which the Yugoslav guy was was at Full Sutton. That was there, was there was real problems there, and mm. you know, so it's it's um, and I know questions were asked in Parliament about Full Sutton because of vandalism and stuff. So yeah, so it's a, the story of integration I think is, is a really mm. interesting one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll make the obvious political point as well that your talk needs to be heard by some of the people who rant on about Britain in the Second World War. Um, you know, it is another reminder that, you know, Britain happened to be the only European country that wasn't overrun by the Nazis, but actually it won because of all the other Europeans who did, you know, fight with us. It's not, you know, it's a very good riposte what you've said today to that kind of, you know, attitude we hear um, from certain people in our, in our society. You're on David, mute. You're David. on mute. I mean, the story of, of, of the Polish role in World War II I, mean, I think I think the only way people might have come across it in popular culture is Gene Hackman as Sobobowski in in uh, Bridge Too Far. Yeah. But if that wasn't Anders. That wasn't Polish Second Corps. That was a parachutist. Mm. But that's you know that's the only representation uh, I think of, of of the Polish in in kind of British World War II popular culture. Yeah. Mm. 
I'm, I'm afraid we'll uh, have to stop the questions there. Uh